Just a moment though before we get started, I want to give a quick shout out to Hextech Store once again which is running a promotion for the current Never Gas Capsule event right now. If you want to coast to the capsule progress for cheaper then feel free to use their service. Links to their website and discord server are in the description below. But let's not waste any more time and get back to the video. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Badly Designed Abilities. It's been a long while since we've done one of these and there's still a ton of abilities that are on my hit list. So for a good change of pace, today we're going to be doing a part 4. I know I said in part 3 that I was done with the series forever or for a long time but I mean it's been almost a year so that constitutes a long time. If you're joining us for the first time be sure to check out my first 3 episodes after this this one, although it's not necessary to watch those videos to understand this one. This is sort of going to be a continuation of part 3 which went over abilities that are either not very satisfying to use or feel like they don't have much cohesion with the rest of the champion's kit. I'm going to focus on a similar methodology for this one, zeroing in on abilities that feel very unpleasant or useless to deal with, as well as a few that are inherently not very good for the game's experience, at least in my opinion. As a reminder, this video will be largely subjective. What I think is unsatisfying or toxic to use you might disagree with or have a different perspective on. With that said, my approach will be taking into consideration how the ability functions on its own, as well as in the context of the champion's kit. However, unlike the previous episodes, this one will pertain to current balance, as in things could change. Be that as it may, I don't anticipate these abilities getting any improvements anytime soon, namely because they were intentionally rendered into that state. In other words, there's a high likelihood they'll stay that way. We have a lot to go through, so let's get started with ability number one. Kogma's passive is one that I'm sure many of you were wondering when I'd go over, seeing as it's widely considered one of the most useless passives in the game. The Cathian Surprise triggers upon taking fatal damage, causing Kogma to become a non-functional unit that can be controlled for 4 seconds. At the end of the duration, he explodes, dealing heavy true damage to all targets nearby. Sounds impressive on paper, a death passive that allows you to turn into a living suicide bomb can potentially do up to 2750 true damage if he manages to hit everyone. But there are three things that make this ability go from not half bad to complete garbage. First, 4 seconds is a long time, enough for most champions, especially in the mid to late game, to simply get away from Kogma before he explodes. He does gain bonus movement speed while in this state, but any form of mobility or a tempo increase will nullify the significance of that. Second, Kogma is seldom in a situation where he can strike more than one target even if he could. Being an ADC, he's usually at the back of a teamfight. The only way he dies is if someone gap closes on him like an assassin or a diver, or if he gets sniped from afar by Zareth or something. The assassin probably has enough mobility to get the hell out of dodge, while the ranged champion is too far away to catch. Third, the true damage is a fixed amount. It doesn't scale based on its attack damage or ability power. If it did, then maybe it would be a decent passive, but it doesn't really do a whole lot. 550 at level 18 is not that much more than a regular damaging ability. It's just bad. Like, really bad. I think what will make this better is if Kogma was allowed to attach himself onto a champion so he can at least blow up on one person, kind of like a zillion time bomb. Up next is Kled's W, Violent Tendencies. This one might come off as a strange choice for some of you given how much freaking damage this attack can do. While off cooldown, Kled's next 4 attacks within 4 seconds gain 150% bonus attack speed with the final attack dealing massive damage to the tune of 6.5 base plus 5% per 100 bonus AD max health damage. Kled normally has around 200 AD mid game and close to 300 late game, making his W deal over 20% max health damage and has a rather low cooldown of 5 seconds at rank 5. So what's wrong with it? Unlike Kogma's passive, it's not a useless ability per se, but the fact that you have no voluntary control over when to use it is a big reason why Kled is an unpopular champion. Violent Tendencies is one of the best abilities for short burst trades in the game, and can easily clutch out a fight when used to grab Skarl back. Thing is, you have to use it, especially during laning phase, just to last at minions, giving Kled a very predictable window of vulnerability since your lane opponent can see when your W is on cooldown. Mind you, it's not the only reason no one plays Kled, but that's a big contributor to it. The problem is, making Violent Tendencies activatable on demand is an equally bad choice. Like I said, it's one of the strongest abilities for short burst trades to ever exist, so by letting the Kled player hold on to their W whenever they want to, they have a huge pressure advantage. Let's move on to Teemo's W, Move Quick. It does exactly what the name suggests, it makes Teemo move quick. Passively, he gains bonus movement speed after 5 seconds of not taking damage from enemy champions or turrets, and when activated, he doubles that movement speed for 3 seconds. Move Quick has to be one of the most underwhelming abilities in the game. It's literally just movement speed. Teemo mains might argue that having that extra tempo is amazing for kiting enemies, but when you think of champions with other tempo moves like Hecarim, Viego, Yone who can move fast and do something else, it makes Teemo's W feel like a relic from 2009. Which, I mean it is. 
Timo has been buffed so many times throughout the past 5 years or so and he's still having trouble maintaining a positive win rate because one of his abilities does absolutely nothing but make him slightly faster. I heard in Wild Rift, Timo's W is a dash. Now despite the last thing I want for Timo is to have a dash, casting Vice aside it would be more meaningful for his gameplay. Continuing down the list, we have Shaco's W. A lot of W's today. Although W tends to be the one champion's max last, so it makes sense. Although in this case, Shaco's Jack in the Box has to be one of the most infuriating abilities in the game. He sets down a trap that becomes untargetable and invulnerable to enemies while invisible. Upon enemy contact, it reveals itself and fears all nearby enemies for up to 1.5 seconds while dealing magic damage to all of them repeatedly. I get it, Shaco's a trickster and Jack in the Box is a perfect way to fake out opponents, but the way it does so makes it less of a disruption tool and more of a zoning one. Jack in the Box is the only trap in the game that applies AoE hard crowd control and it's invisible and it has a wide detection radius, whereas something like Caitlyn's Yodel Snap Trap is visible, can only touch one person, and you have to be standing right on top of it to get hit. If it were just a damage, that would be fine, but a 1.5 second fear is pretty obnoxious especially towards the mid to late game, letting an assassin who, archetypally speaking, should perform worse against multiple enemies, single-handedly shut down the enemy team's tempo by throwing boxes everywhere. There is a reason Shaco is one of the most despised champions in the game. Deceive and Hallucinate are already annoying as it is, but Jack in the Box is the one that really grinds people's gears. It's such a broken ability. Each individual box can inflict an AoE fear for 1.5 seconds and deal a lot of damage if he goes AP Shaco. Even if he goes AD Shaco, no assassin should be allowed to have this kind of ability. On the subject of toxic abilities, let's talk about Singe's Q, Poison Trail. The funny thing is, I used this as an example in part 3 of an ability that's aggravating to go up against but doesn't really set off the alarm as much as others. That doesn't mean it's not a badly designed ability though. While active, Singe leaves a poison cloud at his present location that lingers for just over 3 seconds, dealing damage over time to anyone standing within it, and man it does a lot. One touch of his trail causes you to sustain 120 base plus 90% AP magic damage in total. The reason Poison Trail is badly designed is not because it's overpowered nor does it feel underwhelming to use. On the contrary, Singe means love this ability, it's the whole reason they play him in the first place. It's badly designed because it explicitly discourages confrontation. Singe emits poison at his current location that lingers for a short while, so the only way to gas your enemies is to put poison down and run, which is what Singe players do and why there's that whole meme of don't chase Singed. I'm aware you can toggle poison trail then walk up and fling someone so that they're thrown into it, but that still perpetuates the notion of not wanting to engage in direct confrontation, as there will only ever be poison behind you, not in front of you. His method of exerting pressure is to run around in circles to spread poison everywhere instead of taking his opponents head on. Not saying every champion has to attack directly, but it forces Singed and by proxy the enemy team to play the game in a deviant way, which isn't exactly conducive to a fun experience as everyone else engages directly. Singed is the only champion who doesn't. It's just a really degenerate and poorly thought out win condition to follow where the less you interact with your opponent, the better. Jarvan the Force W is up next, Golden Aegis. At first glance, it's a very intuitive ability to have on a diver like him, someone who goes head first into the enemy team. First, it slows all enemies hit by up to 35% for 2 seconds. Then he gets a shield for a base amount plus more for every champion hit. Not too bad seeing as Jarvan is usually taking on 3 or more members of the enemy team in head to head 5v5s. But uh, there's just one problem, the shield value. At max, assuming you're literally hitting the entire enemy team, Golden Aegis gives you 140 base plus 6.5% of his max HP. This has to be the lamest shield in the entire game. For a comparison, let's look at Jonas Spirit Cleave. If he hits an enemy champion, he gets a shield for 110 base plus 110% bonus AD. Once he gets around 3 to 4 items, that turns out to be around a 300 to 400 HP shield. That's against one champion. If he hits all 5 members of the enemy team, the shield is 220 base plus 220% bonus AD, on top of dealing a huge amount of percent health hybrid damage. Jarvan's shield is arguably the worst shield in the game. What sucks is that it wasn't always like this. Jarvan's a very popular pro play champion by virtue of his amazing team fighting gauge. Most of the time, players would run full tank on him and rely on the base damage from Dragon Strike and Martial Cadence, as well as the attack speed buff for him and his team to handle the rest. Due to this, Riot ended up nerfing Golden Aegis over and over again while buffing the attack power of Dragon Strike and Cataclysm. On version 7.7, .7, it used to shield for 165 base plus 4% max health per enemy champion, so max value would be 20% HP. 165 plus 20% max HP is a far more worthwhile shield compared to 140 plus 6.5. They kept nerfing this over and over again because of pro play, so nowadays you almost never see Tank Jarvan because it's not worth it anymore. His W is so useless, I bet J4 players would rather have Teemo's W than Golden Aegis. 
Yorick's W is another ability I've gotten tons of comments about. Contextually, it's actually the kind of ability you would want to have on a guy like him. He commands an entire army of minions that attack whatever they see, and while they deal a ton of damage, especially if you get all four of them out, the downside is that most champions can straight up walk away from them and they'll be fine. So having a way to trap enemies in place is convenient and practical, which is what Dark Procession is for. It summons a small cage of terrain that traps all enemy units within it for 4 seconds. In order to escape, you either have to dash out or break the wall with a certain number of auto attacks. In totality, Dark Procession does exactly what it's supposed to do, and if you land it on someone without a dash, they're going to take a ton of damage. So where's the problem then? The problem lies in the probability of Yorick's W actually working. With a target range of only 600, he has to be reasonably close to his opponent, making it very obvious he's thinking about it. There's also a 0.75 second cast time, which is enough for most champions to simply react to it and walk out of range unless you predict where they're pathing towards it to make him less likely to escape. The only time Dark Procession can easily trap someone is if you tag them with Morning Mist beforehand, which is also difficult to consistently hit. Dark Procession overall feels really underwhelming to use, except for very specific situations like if you use it on a champion without dashes or fast auto attack speed. That's pretty much only mages. Every other champion can either break the wall quickly or dash out of it. That's the main reason people don't like playing York. He can do tons of damage, but it's so dang hard to get the ideal circumstances to exert that damage because Dark Procession doesn't even do anything half the time. While we're talking about conditional lockdown, I want to draw a parallel between Dark Procession and Infernal Chains. Aatrox's W feels like a pretty lame ability at times given that you can walk right out of it, even though it slows you for the duration. But what makes it more effective is that the Aatrox player can somewhat consistently guarantee their target will get sucked back into the center if he lands one or two speed spots of his Q. So there is a bit of skill expression involved. This may be a hot take, but I feel like if Yorick's Morning Mist grounded targets hit, that would make Dark Procession not feel as pointless, since you'll have at least a second or two of them trapped in the cage, unable to dash. Just move for thought. One last ability to go over, and we'll wrap things up. Master Yu's Meditation, specifically the newly reworked one. For those who aren't aware, Meditation received a small change in 12.13, where it is a far lower cooldown than before, dropping from 28 seconds to 9. However, you can now channel Meditation indefinitely at the cost of 6% of its maximum mana per second. Furthermore, for the first half second, Master Yi gains 90% damage reduction, so if timed correctly, he can mitigate a huge burst of damage. I was never a fan of Meditation, and by extension any activate to lower damage abilities like Irelia's Defiant Dance, because most of the time players use it to extend their advantage, not necessarily use it defensively. The thing with Meditation is that it gives Master Yi an insane neutral game. It's essentially an infinite sustain provided you have blue buff, and you will most of the time, you're a jungler. He is supposed to be a rushdown glass cannon. Having something like this goes against that very principle. It's true that assassins and skirmishers are designed to have some measure of situational protection to avoid enemy fire, but that's what Alpha Strike is for. Meditate allowing him to turn a potentially 2000 damage attack into 200 instantly with the press of a button, while doubling as a neutral sustain tool that has no drawback other than stopping your tempo for a brief moment to use it, is frankly unfair because it's on him. This ability would make more sense on a mage with no mobility as a defensive tool or a tanky bruiser who is expected to absorb a lot of pressure, not a rushdown champion who's already capable of dodging attacks with another ability. I hardly ever see Master Yi players use Meditate to buy time and disadvantage. I usually see them use it to survive a tower shot or auto attack reset. You can try to argue that it's better than giving him raw durability, but there are better ways for skill expressive defense, which he already has, Alpha Strike, even though Alpha Strike has its own problems. Alrighty, that's it for today's episode. What are your thoughts on the abilities I chose today? Do you agree or disagree with my points on them? Let me know in the comments down below. I do plan to make a part 5 later this year, so if you have any abilities you think I should go over, feel free to share them as well. Aside from that, if you enjoyed, I'd appreciate it if you could leave a like and subscribe. Consider following me on Twitter at VarsRam, joining my Discord server, and checking out my previous episodes on badly designed abilities if you haven't yet. But till next time, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon in the next one. Take care.